It is now time for a question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Royal Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. Um, Premier, we had some devastating news this morning in London, Ontario, where Kellogg's is now closing down a plant. It's been there for generations. These are 500 well-paying jobs in our province. And sadly, this is the latest of a hemorrhaging of middle-class, good manufacturing jobs in our province. Premier, I've asked you every day in the legislature when you're going to bring forward a jobs plan to reverse the decline, to bring good jobs back to the province of Ontario. Leadership. It's time for leadership. My, my simple question is, with, with three days left in the session, are we going to see a jobs plan from your government? Are you out of ideas? Are we going to see more jobs leave the province of Ontario like Kellogg's? Can you bring forward a jobs sure. plan and bring jobs back to our province? You've got three days left in the session. Will you do so? Thank you. Uh, the member from Prince Edward Hastings will come to order. Premier. Thank, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I, uh, I certainly agree with the uh, premise of the first part of the, uh, uh, le the opposition leader's question, and that is that this is very bad news for the families and for the workers at Kellogg's. My, and my first concern is for the affected workers, Mr. Speaker, and the impact that this will have on their families um, and on the broader community. The Ministry of Training, Colleges and Universities is closely monitoring the situation, Mr. Speaker, and they will respond quickly to the announced layoffs. They have, as I understand it, they have not been uh, contacted at this point, but they will respond immediately, and they will work with the other levels of government, Mr. Speaker, to ensure coordinated services um, for all of those affected. Um, we'll continue to support growth and expansion, Mr. Speaker, of Ontario's agri-food business, and in the supplementaries, I will, talk about, I will talk about some of the investments that have been made and the businesses that that are uh, coming to the province. But my Thank first you. concern is for those affected workers in Ka at Kellogg's. Mr. Thank Speaker. you. Supplementary. But Pretty Premier, you, applause over there. But Premier, you're the Minister of Agriculture. You keep seeing food processing jobs disappear. And we can still buy these products. We can still buy Kellogg's Special K, Raisin Bran, but it's no longer being made in Ontario. It's going to be made in the state of Michigan. We saw Heinz ketchup now will be coming out of Ohio instead of the province of Ontario. Our greatest export seems to be manufacturing jobs. I, I want to turn that around. I, and I, I don't doubt that, that you're going to reach out. You're going to try to help these families. You're going to try with retraining. Good for you as a job as premier. But a bigger goal is actually bring good jobs back to our province of Ontario to stop the hemorrhaging, to make Ontario open for investment, to give some hope, not for an unemployment check or a new course, but a hope for a good, steady, middle class jobs you can provide for your Question. family. That's what we're fighting for. So let me ask you this. There are three days left in the session. You have no jobs plan. Will you agree to a PC call to extend the city of legislature to give you time to bring a jobs plan to turn this province over? You see the place? You see the place? Thank you. The uh, member from. The Minister of Health will come to order. The Minister of the Environment will come to order. The member from Renfrew Nipissing Pembroke will come to order. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And, um, I want to speak about some of the specific uh, support that we've given to Kellogg's over the last few years. The and member from Northumberland will come to order. 474 member from Leeds Grenville will come to order. Jobs, Mr. Speaker, 474,700 net new jobs that have been created in this province since June 2009. And since February, Mr. Speaker, 59,200 net new jobs, Mr. Speaker, in Ontario. So um, I'm happy member from to come back Callan to the come to order. Uh, support of Canada's projections, which are very good, Mr. Speaker. But I want to talk specifically about uh, Kellogg's. Kent, Middlesex, in 2007, come to order. Kellogg's uh, built a 205,000 square foot Page Grenville, material come to order. Second time. in Belleville, Mr. Speaker, and that was an investment of $120 million initially. Our, the Ontario government provided financial support for that initial investment, Mr. Speaker, over $9 million, uh, a loan under the Advanced Manufacturing Investment Strategy. So, Mr. Speaker, Answer. when the Leader of the Opposition talks about a jobs plan, we've been implementing a jobs plan, Mr. Speaker. Jobs are coming to Ontario. It is very unfortunate that this Thank particular you. plant is shutting down, but there are jobs. Thank you. Final supplementary. Premier, if this is your jobs plan, 
it's got to be time for you to pack it up and go because we're losing jobs every single week. And when I hear that your plans are to double down on Dalton McGuinty's failed energy policies, you're going to drive hydro rates further through the roof. You measure your success based on how many bills you get through with more and more red tape. How do we measure our success? How you grow the economy, how many jobs you create to make Ontario number one in Canada. 500 good, well-paying jobs, 500 private sector union jobs, joining the ranks of the 100,000 that we've lost already. The only jobs you're creating seem to be government jobs or minimum wage jobs in the private sector. I believe we can do a lot better than this. I believe we can Ma give hope question, for those who have lost hope to restore pay and great promises of Ontario. Will you extend the sitting, bring forward a jobs plan that will give you at least Thank eight you. days to give hope to those who are losing hope? You see it, please? Everybody knows you're Minister of the Environment will come to order, second time. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I think the, the Leader of the Opposition knows full well that we offered the Opposition Member the from opportunity Dufferin to support Caledon, second night time sittings, last. Mr. Speaker, exactly. so we could get more exactly. legislation through. Exactly. They voted against night sittings, Mr. Speaker, so that offer of uh, a longer time. And, Mr. Speaker, I want to draw the Leader of the Opposition's attention to the Conference Board of Canada report, Mr. Speaker, that came out. Uh, and what it says is, it's a very positive report yesterday, Mr. Speaker, Minister Ontario's Affairs, economic order. growth rate jump projected 1.2% in 2013. 2.2% in 2014, Fantastic. projected 2.6% in, in 2015. The province's economy will add more than 300,000 jobs from 2013 to 2015, and Ontario's exports will benefit from a lower Canadian dollar relative to the U.S. dollar, Mr. Speaker. The work we are doing on this side of the House, the investments that we are making are working, Mr. Speaker. The fact is the member from it's Stormont, unfortunate Dundas, that there is a readjustment that Kellogg's has made up corporate decision, Mr. Speaker, and that will affect the plant in London, and that's Middlesex. very unfortunate. Lampton, well, Kent, Middlesex, last time. Finish, please. Wrap up. Do not diminish the pain at all, Mr. Speaker, that those people who are at the Kellogg's plant in London will feel, Mr. Speaker. But it is our responsibility to look at the broader Thank picture, you. make sure we give those people the support. Thank we you. will do that, Mr. Speaker. New question. Leader of the Opposition. Thanks. Back to Premier. I, I don't doubt that the Premier feels for these people. We all do here in the Assembly. They just want a leader with a plan who's going to give them a job, not a UI check. That's all they want in the province of Ontario. Premier references a Conference Board of Canada report. What that report actually says is the Americans are recovering. They're going to demand more products. They're, they're highlighting the American recovery, and no wonder, because Kellogg's is moving from Ontario to the United States. Caterpillar has moved from Ontario to the United States. John Deere has moved from Ontario to the United States. We have Hedges Automotive in Welland, Ontario, that has picked up and moved to the United States. They blame the high cost of electricity. They blame the tax and regulatory environment. They blame the bill after bill after bill you bring in that binds their hands and undermines our competitiveness. Yeah, you're damn right the Americans are growing. They're taking all of our jobs. I want to see the jobs of the province of Ontario. Why don't you? You see there, please. Thank you. Premier. Mr. Speaker, well, the premise of the Leader of the Opposition's question is just not true, Mr. Speaker. The fact is there are companies coming to this province, and I can go through the list. Natra is setting up a confectionery food processor in London, Mr. Speaker, a manufacturing facility. Ferrero in Brantford. Royal Cannon in uh, Puslinch. Parados in Mississauga. Um, Maidstone Bakery in uh, Brantford. Dr. Oetker in London, Mr. Speaker. Bolt House Farms in Wheatley. So, Mr. Speaker, there are food processors processing plants, and we're talking just about that sector, there are food processing plants that are opening and expanding in this province. The fact is that there's a very difficult situation that's taking place right now at Kellogg's, and I do not diminish that in any way. I understand that that is a concern, but the fact also is, Mr. Speaker, that Kellogg's has located in Belleville. We have made investments in that plant in Belleville, Mr. Speaker. Kellogg has uh, invested several, several million dollars in packaging technology in, in Belleville. The plan Thank you. Supplementary. Premier, they're not relocating from London to Belleville. They're closing down. 550 people out of work. And, and you, you tried this Bobby McFerrin spin, don't, don't worry, be happy. But all of us should worry. 
and those that have lost their jobs are far from happy. They want to see a leader with a plan to actually get people into good jobs again, to put entrepreneurs back in business, to, to balance their books. I've laid out that plan. My team and I have laid out that plan. Nova Chemicals, another project at risk in Sarnia, Ontario, to bring a couple hundred jobs, a polyethylene plant. They're looking between the states and the province of Ontario. They're seeing energy rates go through the roof. I want those jobs here. I want to give hope. I don't want to see any more Kellogg's, any more Cats. I don't want to see any more John Deere's, CCL's, Garcia in Brad. I want to see jobs staying here. We'll give you an extra week. Will you please come with a plan and stop the bleeding Thank from you. manufacturing jobs? Hey, you see it, please? You see it, please? Thank you. Bring it. Okay, well, the reality is that Ontario is up 179% in job creation since the recession, and the U.S. is up 85%, Mr. Speaker. So the premise of the Leader of the Opposition's question is completely flawed. We are recovering more quickly than U.S. US jurisdictions, Mr. Speaker, and the fact is we are making investments in advanced manufacturing. Let's just be clear. The plan that the Leader of the Opposition is putting forward, Mr. Speaker, is one that would, would provoke a race to the bottom. When he talks about right to work, what he's talking about is undermining the organized labour in this province. The member from the PN Carlton will come to order. The member from Leeds Grenville is warned. The member, the Minister for Rural Affairs is warned. Thunder Bay Atacolkin, come to order. Complete, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The underpinning of what the Leader of the Opposition is talking about, Mr. Speaker, is, is uh, undermining of the gains in job yes, protection that have been made over decades by organized labour. We're not going there, Mr. Speaker. Final supplementary. The problem is, Premier, your plan is for people to work for zero. Yeah, exactly. The folks at Kellogg's who had this disastrous news today are going to make zero. Those at Heinz are making zero. Those at Hennages in Welland are making zero. Those who worked at Extrada in Timmins, now in Quebec, are making zero in the province of Ontario. I, I could go on all question period. Premier, my point is we need to stop the bleeding. We need to restore hope to this province. We need to say to that young university graduate Pretty who's general, got come to order. Degree, that she has a future here in the province of Ontario. We need to say to that young trades are getting into being an electrician that they can find hope here in Ontario, not Saskatchewan, British Columbia, Michigan, Indiana. They are eating our lunch. It's time for a new plan. It's time to turn things around. Question. I cleared the deck so you can bring forward a plan. You failed to do so. Will you bring forward a plan before Christmas? If not, steal our plan. We've got one. We can turn this around. Thank you. Get on back Thank you. Please. Be please. Be seated, please. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, I understand that the Leader of the Opposition is going to keep banging this drum, but the reality is that we are up 474,700 net new jobs, Mr. Speaker, since June 2009. That is just the reality. Since February, we're up 59,200 net new jobs. 179. The member from Nepean Carleton, last time. The member from Northumberland, you're warned. Carry on. 179 percent recovery, Mr. Speaker, since the recession. These are not numbers that we're making up. These are objective numbers, Mr. Speaker. So the fact is, there is a recovery. I am very, very disappointed that the people at Kellogg's in London are going through what they're going through, Mr. Speaker. But the fact is, we have to look at the whole picture. We are recovering jobs, and we're going to continue to do that, Mr. Speaker. New question: The leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. After years of delay and discussion, the government has once again promised to take steps to rein in public sector CEO compensation. Can the Premier tell us what her CEO pay cap will be and when it may be in place? Thank you. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, as I have said uh, in the House before, we intended and we are acting on, uh, on our commitment to, uh, to review and to put in place 
ranges, which would, would mean caps on, uh, on executive compensation, Mr. Speaker. Um, the fact is that the proposal that the leader of the third party put forward did not take into account benefits, Mr. Speaker, did not take into account the full benefit package, the full compensation package. We believe we need to do that. Um, that was a blunt instrument that they brought forward. We need a much more sophisticated and strategic approach, and that's what we're going to put in place, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, supplementary. Speaker, people have heard promises from this government for years, but the same old policies and tired ideas stay in place. Right. As the gas plant scandal, in fact, was heating up last September, the Liberals tried to change the channel and promised to implement a salary cap at twice the pay of the Premier. Now, instead of making it happen, they actually shut down the legislature. And last year, the CEO of Hydro One got a raise of $70,000. That pay hike alone is more than most families make in an entire year. Can the Premier tell us how many five- and six-figure pay hikes we'll see next year, Speaker? Thank you, Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. So, in uh, what we have said is that we will act on our commitment, which is to uh, introduce legislation to directly control the compensation of uh, senior executives across the broader public service, Mr. Speaker, including hard caps. But in doing that, we need to establish some, fr some frameworks, Mr. Speaker, and we need to do the research that would allow us to bring in a piece of legislation that would actually deal with the issue and would not be a blunt instrument that would not take into account full compensation packages. Mr. Speaker. So that is the work that we are going to do. We will introduce the legislation in early 2014. That was our commitment, and we will follow through on it. Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Final supplementary. Speaker, in 2010, and again less than a month ago, Liberal MPPs voted against capping CEO salary. But now they claim they're ready to move forward. The record speaks for itself. In 2010, the Liberals voted against capping CEO salaries. In 2012, they promised to cap CEO salaries. In 2013, they voted against capping CEO salaries. Now, with the Auditor General scheduled to release her annual report this afternoon, the Liberals are making another desperate ploy to try and change the channel once again. <laughs> Why should people believe the Liberals this time, Speaker? Thank you, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, we said we were going to do this, and we are following through on that. And I believe that uh, last week, when the leader of the third party was talking about her plan, it was very difficult for her to explain what exemptions she would have in place, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. And to my point about having to have legislation that's strategic and understands the sophistication of the issue and understands that we have to look at whole compensation packages, Mr. Speaker, and we have to look at a range of techni technical expertise that's needed in various sectors. That's why we need legislation that encompasses all of that and is not a blunt instrument. So, Mr. Speaker, it's true that members of our uh, government have voted against a blunt instrument legislation that would not do that, would not accomplish what uh, the leader of the third party is saying it would. So we are going to act to make sure that the legislation we introduce deals with the complexity of the concerns around those executive sure. compensation packages, the whole packages. That's the work that we're going to do, Mr. Speaker. New question, the leader of the third party. Questions for the uh, speaker. Thank you, or for the uh, premier. Thank you, speaker. Uh, this premier just doesn't seem to get it. People can't make ends meet, and at the same time, they're watching high hydro rates drive jobs out of the province. We saw it in the Ring of Fire, the Heinz factory closing in Leamington, or today's jarring news out of London about the loss of more than 500 jobs at the Kellogg's plant. People expect their government to take every step possible to curb high hydro bills. Instead, people are watching as CEOs and executives at their power companies get paid hikes that are higher get pay hikes rather that are higher than their annual paychecks. Is the premier ready to cap public sector CEO salaries and pass the savings on to the people who are paying the bills? Speaker. Thank you. Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, we've already said that we're going to introduce legislation to directly control the compensation of senior executives across the broader public sector, including hard caps. So the answer is yes. We've made a commitment to do that, and we have said we are going to introduce that legislation to do exactly that. But we are going to do it in such a way, Mr. Speaker, that is going to guarantee that we look at the whole compensation packages, Mr. Speaker.
Speaker, that we look at the expertise that is needed in various sectors, and that we recognize the, the complexity of the issue. To take a blunt instrument, as the leader of the third party has suggested, which she couldn't even explain, Mr. Speaker, in terms of what the exemptions would be, does not make sense. That is not good public policy. That is why we did not support it, Mr. Speaker. So we are going to introduce legislation that is actually going to put in place those hard caps in a way that takes into account the full compensation yeah, yeah. package. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, if people work hard and play by the rules, they should be able to get ahead. But as the bills keep going up, people are working harder and harder just to make ends meet. Nellie is retired. She wrote to us, and I quote, Hydro rates Hydro rate increases dramatically affect the lifestyle of seniors who are on fixed pension incomes. We just keep trying to trim back anywhere we can. I try to have the necessities, not luxury items. Even food is getting difficult with the rising prices. Who will be the one to put a stop to all these ongoing increases by people making exorbitant salaries that are more than one of us make over a lifetime?" Unquote. Does the Premier have an answer for seniors like now? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, I think the leader of the third party knows that we have put in place programs to uh, to support and give a break to exactly the kind of person that uh, that the uh, leader is talking about. People who uh, are on a low income, Mr. Speaker, and who are struggling. And we recognize that uh, that they need a break on on hydro rates and they need support on property taxes and so on, Mr. Speaker. So we've put those programs in place. We also, Mr. Speaker, in terms of the long-term energy plan, have worked to take costs out of the system. So the uh, renegotiation of the Samsung deal, the reductions, Mr. Speaker, as a result of not going ahead with new nuclear. We have made those decisions, Mr. Speaker, because we recognize the importance of affordability. The other issue, Mr. Speaker, is the focus on conservation and putting supports in place so that people can conserve, because that is, that is the cheapest uh, power, Mr. Speaker, is power that is not used. Yes, but, Mr. Speaker, I would ask the leader of the third party, what is her plan in terms of energy costs going forward, Mr. Speaker? How would she reduce costs? Final supplementary. Speaker, people are finding it tougher to balance the household budget. The government is telling people to tighten their belts, but despite all the promises from this government, salaries for top CEOs keep going up. We received an email that said, and I quote, my hubby's salary is identical as in 2008. Meanwhile, the cost of hydro skyrockets and the hydro companies run ads and pay executives high you know, huge salaries. End quote. Judy wrote, quote, I keep reading about enormous profits and equally high management salaries at Hydro. It's no win for the consumer and win-win for the companies and executives. End quote. After 10 years, Speaker, of Liberal government, does this Premier really think Question. that people believe her when she said she needs a little more time to study the problem of million-dollar salaries for public sector CEOs? Thank you. Well, the tone of the uh Leader of the Third Party's question notwithstanding, Mr. Speaker, we are introducing legislation in early 2014. We made a commitment. I, I think the Leader of the Third Party knows that we believe that there needs to be uh, a very clear action taken with regard to executive compensation. We are going to do that. But, Mr. Speaker, we are going to do it in a way that takes into account the whole compensation, not just part of the compensation. And as I said, the leader of the third party's plan did not countenance the whole compensation packages, and she could not explain when asked what the exemptions were, how to deal with technical expertise. Those are the issues that need to be addressed, Mr. Speaker, because we want to put in place good public policy that's going to guarantee that the, the work that is done is done in the best Answer. way possible, but that we have those hard caps in place. That's what our legislation Thank will do, you. The member from Halton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question to the Minister of Health. Minister, we are again joined in the House uh, today by Kim Fletcher, with whom you'll be familiar. Ms. Fletcher is accompanied by, uh, with Mike Box, who has Bell's plasma blastic non-Hodgkin lymphoma, and who, like Kim, could not get OHIP coverage for his prescribed drug, Velcode. With them also, well, Maddie is not here, but she, she was here this morning. She's tired, to, too tired to come into the house. And she has fistic, cystic fibrosis, for whom the drug Calatico has dramatically increased her lung function. And others have joined them. Maddie is here. Maddie's here. She's in the back. Hey, Minister Kim and her colleagues are here because Ontario's health care system doesn't work for them. 
and you have said that health care is about patients first. Will you put these Ontario patients first, Minister? Question. They rely on you to help them. What will you tell them today as their Minister of Health? Will you make it, make it right for them Thank you. today? Minister of Health and long term care. You see it, please? You see it, please? Thank you. Minister of Health and long term care. Well, thank you, Speaker, and I welcome, uh, I welcome the, the people who are, we're talking about today and their family members and loved ones uh, here to the House today. I want you to know that uh, we are very, very committed to getting people the drugs they need and the drugs that work for them, Speaker. We, do, uh, we have tripled funding for cancer-fighting uh, drugs. Uh, we've done that because we want people to get the very best shot, Speaker. We do have a process. We have taken the politics out of making decisions around what drugs, uh, what drugs are funded, Speaker, and we did that for very good reason. We think that it is the experts who should give us advice on what drugs are effective, and, Speaker, that is what we do. Thank you. Supplementary, the member from Whitby, Oshawa. Minister, on November 8th, Roche, the manufacturer of Avastin, sent you and the committee to evaluate drugs, new information about a study from McGill University Hospital using Avastin to treat brain cancer. The results of the study indicated that Avastin was efficacious in prolonging the lives of patients with glioblastoma multiform, the cancer affecting Kim Fletcher. Roche has suggested that your government look at reimbursement under a conditional funding mechanism like the Evidence Building Program, and Roche has also indicated a willingness to share the risk. Minister, it's now December 10th, and you and the committee have had over a month to review this information, yet nothing has been done, and I understand the committee has not even met. Time is clearly of the essence here. Kim Fletcher deserves an answer. When will she get one? Yes, Speaker, um, uh, the work that is done by the Committee to Evaluate Drugs and sub uh, subcommittees of that, uh, of that committee is, uh, is founded on the best available evidence. They do review new evidence as it Order. comes forward, Speaker, and in fact, the Ontario Steering Committee for Cancer Drug Programs is reviewing the new uh, evidence that uh, Roche has put forward, Speaker. But I say again, we must, we must rely on evidence to make decisions about what drugs work and for what patients. Thank you. A new question. The leader of the third party. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Today, more than 500 people in London who work at Kellogg's woke up to find that their workplace is shutting down. Families aren't just going to be worried about getting their kids' presents over the holidays. They'll be wondering about how they're going to pay the bills. The Liberal government insisted that their plan of higher HST, higher hydro rates and no-strings-attached giveaways would create thousands of jobs. Is the Premier ready to admit that the hundreds of families in London, that this, to the hundreds of families in London, rather, that these same old tired ideas simply aren't working, Speaker? Thank you, Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, I would say to the leader of the third party, as I did to the leader of the opposition, that in fact we have had 179 percent uh, recovery, Mr. Speaker, of jobs since the recession. Uh, that's 474,700 net new jobs. Since February alone, Mr. Speaker, we have 59,200 net new jobs. So, in fact, Mr. Speaker, jobs are coming to the province. We are recovering, Mr. Speaker. I am very, very disappointed, and I am concerned about the people at Kellogg's in London, obviously, Mr. Speaker, and the Ministry of Training Colleges and Universities will be working with, uh, with the community on the ground to make sure that those uh, workers have the supports that they need, Mr. Speaker. But we have to look at the whole picture. We have to look at what's happening across the province, and the fact is that we are recovering, Mr. Speaker, and there will be there will be changes that will happen in particular parts of the province. Thank but you. overall, Mr. Speaker, we need to look at the jobs that are Thank coming. Thank you. Supplementary. 
Well, Speaker, the blows to southwestern Ontario keep coming under this Liberal government. If that's the kind of changes the Premier is proud of, I don't think many people agree with her. Last month, it was hundreds of people losing their jobs at Heinz. Now it's hundreds of people losing their jobs at Kellogg's. The Liberals have talked about the importance of food processing jobs, but that's been all talk, Speaker, and no Sir, action. Training college and universities will come to order last time. solutions that will work, like getting hydro rates under control or rewarding companies when they create jobs or rewarding companies when they actually invest in Ontario. Instead, families in southwestern Ontario get more studies, more conversation and more job loss. Is the Premier going to admit that the Liberal status quo is another body blow to southwestern Ontario that is leaving 500 families in London whether, wondering whether they're Question. going to be able to pay the bills? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, you know, I, uh, I, I hear the, I hear the uh, position of the leader of the third party, Mr. Speaker, but I don't know if she's aware of the companies that are coming to the province. And I went through a list of them: Natra in London, Ferrero in Brantford, Royal Cannon in Puslinch, Mr. Speaker, uh, Parados in Mississauga, Dr. Oetker in London. So, Mr. Isn't Speaker, the there are company? businesses Isn't that are expanding and opening. And, Mr. Speaker, to the leader of the third party's first point about electricity prices, I would say to her once again: What is her plan to reduce electricity costs, Mr. Speaker? What is her plan for the diversity of the mix in this province, Mr. Mr. Speaker, what is her plan to deal with uh, communities in the north who need to be connected, Mr. Speaker? There is no plan, Mr. Speaker. We have a plan. Thank you. The member from Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke is warned. New question. The member from Vaughan. Thank you very much, Speaker. Speaker, my question today is for the Minister of Northern Development and Mines. Last Friday, I had the opportunity to travel to Timmins, along with Premier Kathleen Wynne and eight of my colleagues, to attend the very first Northern Leaders Forum. This forum brought together Northern municipal, Aboriginal and community leaders, as well as members from our government, to discuss ways in which we can continue to drive job creation and economic growth in Northern Ontario. Mr. Speaker, this truly was a historic forum, and I certainly look forward to travelling back to Northern Ontario soon. I'm wondering if the minister could please inform the House of how our government will continue to build on the positive momentum generated by the Northern Leaders Forum. Thank you. Minister. Thanks very much, Mr. Speaker. And the member from Vaughan is absolutely right. This was an historic forum, and uh, I was thrilled that so many members of our government were able to attend, including uh, Premier Wynne. Um, Speaker, our government is absolutely committed to working with all of our partners across northern Ontario to help create a stronger, more diverse, uh, and sustainable northern economy. And I think it's fair to say that as leaders in our communities, uh, we all share responsibility for driving job creation and business growth across the north. So, uh, Speaker, with the support of uh, Premier Wynne, our government is absolutely committed to uh, growing northern Ontario, the economy in northern Ontario. And I was very pleased, uh, as Minister, to commit to uh, holding quarterly meetings with the Aboriginal leadership, uh, NOMA, FANOM, and NOMA moving forward. These meetings will help build on the success of this forum and ensure that Northern Ontario remains in the right track toward prosperity. Thank you. Supplementary. Thanks very much, Speaker, and I thank the minister for that response. I can tell in particular that the minister's announcement of the quarterly meetings was certainly well received by everyone in attendance at the forum. And at, the, uh, at this particular forum, forum, we did discuss a variety of issues. However, one common theme throughout the day was our growth plan for Northern Ontario. Our government is committed to working with Northern leaders in order to advance this growth plan. In fact, this is yet another a part of our government strategy to invest in people, to invest in modern infrastructure and to support a dynamic and innovative business climate. Speaker, will the minister please provide an update to members of this House regarding how our government is working with Northerners, Northerners to implement the growth plan for Northern Ontario? 
to Northern Development and Mines. Thanks so much, uh, Speaker. Since the release of the growth plan for Northern Ontario, we have seen municipalities, organizations, and Aboriginal communities achieve some amazing things uh, that reflect the strength and the resilience that all Northerners share. We've seen the creation of an in independent, not-for-profit uh, Northern Policy Institute, the opening of a new school of law at Lakehead University, a uh, new school of architecture at Laurentian University, continued investments in programs like the Northern Ontario Heritage Fund Corporation, creating jobs all across the north. Our Northern Highways program, over $500 million to, to spend this year. The Northern Community Investment Readiness Program, preparing us for the economic opportunities of the north. Introduction of a new $100 million fund uh, to improve infrastructure in small, rural, and northern communities. Speaker, there's no question Answer. that Northern Ontario has its own set of unique opportunities and challenges, and our government will continue to invest in people, invest in infrastructure, and work to create a dynamic business climate that includes Encourages further growth. Thank, Thank you. you. New question, the member from the PN, Carlton. Uh, thanks very much, Speaker. My question is also to the Premier. Good morning, Premier. Um, yesterday, I had a meeting with a major southwestern Ontario employer in the agri-food uh, sector, and uh, the owner and the investors indicated to me that if uh, they don't get their energy prices under control as a result of your mismanagement in that sector, they're going to have to leave Ontario. That's uh, 400 jobs. Let me explain to you, Speaker, what the real issue is here for them. It's not necessarily their outdated labour policies. It's not necessarily uh, some of their regulatory burdens that are excessive in the province. In this case, it is the global adjustment. Uh, in, uh, in, in January last year, they paid $60,000 for their global adjustment, and by September, that went up to $100,000. Does the Premier think it's fair for a, a, a business in Ontario to be paying over $1 million to the global adjustment while they're struggling to survive Thank you. the province of Ontario? Thank you. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I know the Minister of Energy will want to comment on the supplementary. First of all, let me say once again that I am very disappointed at what has happened at Kellogg's, Mr. Speaker, and uh, the Ministry of Training, Colleges and Universities will be working with the, uh, the workers on the ground. Um, but, Mr. Speaker, in terms of electricity costs, as I have said, our long-term energy plan takes costs out of the system, Mr. Speaker, focuses on conservation, and, Mr. Speaker, the Leader of the Opposition has acknowledged that he has no idea how he would lower costs, Mr. Speaker. He has no idea what his plan would be to deal with electricity costs, Mr. Speaker. He has no idea how he would get costs out of the system, and he has no idea what supply mix he would support, Mr. Speaker, because the opposition party simply opposes everything that we've done in energy. The reality Answer. is we came into office in 2003, Mr. Speaker. We've been cleaning up the energy mess that was left by that party since that day, and we will continue to do so, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, I just told her an Ontario company with 400 employees who pays over a million dollars on the global adjustment alone may leave this province with more people in this province being out of work because of your destructive policies. The question I put to the Premier was a serious one. What is she going to do in order to alleviate the concerns of this company? What is she going to do in order to make sure that the jobs stay in this province? Tim Hudak not only has a plan on how to keep jobs in the province, he also has a plan on affordable energy. We're happy to send it over to her so she can adopt it. We've asked for an extra week to sit here in the Assembly to adopt those plans. Will the Premier take these concerns seriously? Will she Question. stand in place? Will she commit to this party and the rest of the people in the province of Ontario that she will get back to work? Thank you. Order, please. Order, please. Wouldn't double down. <laughs> Premier. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And we offered the opposition party the opportunity to have night sittings this week, Mr. Speaker, if there was more uh, that they would like to discuss, and they voted that down, Mr. Speaker. We have had 179 percent recovery of jobs, Mr. Speaker, since the recession. We have a long-term energy plan that actually takes costs out of the system, Mr. Speaker, and puts in place a sustainable, predictable plan that the energy sector needs, Mr. Speaker, and that people in this province need in order to be able to know how their uh, how their uh, energy supply is going to work over the next uh, number of years, Mr. Speaker. So, in fact, we have a plan in place. I am very disappointed at what's happening at Kellogg's, Mr. Speaker, and you know the reality is that we will work with those folks and make sure that uh, they have all the supports that they yes, need. Sir. And at the same time, Mr. Speaker, there are food processors coming to Ontario, and we are going to work to make sure that that trend continues. Thank there you very is. much, Mr. Speaker. The question, the member from Nickelbelt. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Ma question est pour la Première Ministre également. Speak. I have a question for the Prime Minister. A number of excuses as to why she did not release the forensic audit at Orange. Then, yesterday, she says her hands were tied in terms of releasing this information because of an ongoing OPP investigation. But the fact is, the OPP gave approval for the release of this audit back in May of 2013, telling the Minister of Health that the audit's release would not have an impact on the ongoing OPP investigation. Will the Premier tell us which story she believes, the OPP or her Minister of Health? Thank you, Speaker, and I welcome the opportunity to uh, to discuss this, Speaker. I was the one who uh, it was it, it, in my ministry that called for that forensic audit to happen in the first place, Speaker. I did receive an interim report in February. Uh, members of the committee have had that interim report for uh, for many many months, Speaker. Uh, Contained in that interim report was inf information that, for me, uh, indicated that there was a serious se there were serious allegations, Speaker, and that was referred to the Ontario Provincial Police. Speaker, that was exactly what should have happened. That was what happened. Uh, the interim report, which the men member opposite has and members of the committee have contained information that led yes, me to directly send that to the OPP. That was the right decision, Speaker. Thank it you. remains the right decision. Two supplementary. Back to the Premier, please. Speaker, it is unbelievable that two years after learning of the scandal at Orange and the minister's lack of oversight, we are still uncovering shameful details. Time and time again, we see a pattern of the Minister of Health failing to do her job of oversight and then refusing to admit that she's made mistake. Yesterday, she claimed and continued to claim that the OPP's investigation tied her hand in the release of the audit. But the fact was that for the last six months, the OPP has been saying the exact opposite. My question is simple to the Premier. Does the Premier think that the Minister of Health handling of the orange file is appropriate? And at what point will the Premier say that enough is enough and demand accountability? Thank you, Minister. Uh, Speaker, I think it's really important to say again that members of the committee requested two million pages of documents that they received. Contained in that, those documents were the forensic audit interim report, Speaker. They received it not once, not twice, but three times. It's clear that members of the committee are requesting documents, and they are not reading that information. Had they read that information, they would have known exactly why the OPP were called in to address that issue. Here, here. Thank you. New question, the member from Scarborough, Guildwood. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. Speaker, my colleagues opposite have expressed shock and concern over the fact that the Pan Para Pan American Games Athletes Village is a separate investment from the operating budget for the Games. As this was publicly announced with the original bid more than four years ago, their shock and concern seems frankly out of place. 
In fact, major newspapers reported this four years ago, and as recent as our 2013 budget states, it is not part of the organizing committee's operating budget. Mr. Speaker, through you to the minister, could he explain what the Athletes' Village will bring as a legacy piece to the West Donlands? Minister of Tourism, Culture, Sport, and Thank you, and thank you, The Pan Carapan uh, Games. Member from Scarborough Gilwood for asking. Speaker, the village is part of a broader revitalization of the West Don lands and the Toronto waterfront. Linking it with Pan and Parapan American Games accelerates the pace of redevelopment by more than 10 years. Speaker, it will also open up adjacent provincial owned land in the West Don lands for future development. Following the Games, the development will become the hub of a new, sustainable, mixed use, pedestrian and bicycle friendly community that includes a new street night car, a new 82,000 square foot YMCA, and, and market housing, affordable housing Answer. and social housing units. Speaker, all these wonderful benefits and legacy will become available when the games are over. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you, Speaker. I am pleased to hear that our government is focused on building an infrastructure legacy that will serve Ontarians for generations to come. As I heard at yesterday's committee, this capability to build Athletes Village is potentially exportable for other games internationally. However, there is concern that despite significant investment in facilities such as Gold Ring Centre and the former Ivor Wynn Stadium, that we will still need to help Toronto's vulnerable. And through our government's investment of $600 million in affordable housing since 2003, there are still far too many Torontonians who are unsure of where they will sleep tonight. Speaker, through you to the minister, can he tell this House how our government and these games will ensure that Ontario's most vulnerable have access to affordable housing? Minister. Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Speaker. Question. And her, tirelessly ad her tireless advocacy for our uh, most vulnerable gives me an opportunity to talk about the importance of the Pan Am Games and the legacy they'll leave for Toronto. After the 10,000 athletes and their team officials leave the province, the Athletes Village will bring new lives and, and opportunities to Toronto's most vulnerable. Great. This legacy project will bring great forward news. affordable rental housing That's to 253 Toronto news. families. It'll go towards making home ownership yeah, easier yeah, with 100 new affordable uni uh, ownership units. And this redevelopment will also see the first ever George Brown College residence yeah, yeah. being wow. built, which will provide affordable housing for 500 students. Our investment will create and support 5,200 jobs yeah, through construction. It will not only build housing, but it will transform the former Don, uh, West Don Valley industrial lands into a beautiful, sustainable, mixed-use neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you. Great. 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 Member from Newmarket, Aurora. Yeah. Speaker, my question is uh, my question is to the Minister of Health. Speaker, in response to the Public uh, Account Committee request for the forensic audit that the minister said she didn't read. Uh, we received the reports yesterday. Equally as disturbing as the results of the actual forensic report was the deputy minister's covering letter, in which he goes out of his way to whitewash the minister's contradictory statements about what she read and when. First, the minister claimed she hadn't read the report. Then, when she realized how incompetent that sounds, she told us she read an interim report. Well, Speaker, now we find that there was never an interim report. What there was was this two-page briefing document Question. that even the Deputy Minister referred to as an interim report. The interim report has 106 pages. This has two. Why did the Minister say she read an interim report when she knows full well she— Thank you. Thank you. Order. Minister of Health. 
Uh, speaker, call it whatever you want. That was the interim report that I received from the forensic investigation team, Speaker. The committee has had that for months and months, Speaker. What's very important to know is that that forensic investigation interim report that the member now agrees he has laid out a very clear case for this whole matter to be referred to the OPP, and that's exactly what happened, Speaker. That was the right decision then, and if I had to make the decision again, I would make the very same decision. The interim report went to the OPP, as did the final report. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, this is beyond bizarre. <laughs> An interim report, two pages. And the minister wants us to believe that we'll simply accept that this is an interim report. 106 pages was the final report. Whoa. This minister was satisfied to not even look at that and be satisfied with a two-page briefing. A briefing for crying out loud, Premier, are you going to accept this from your Minister of Health as competency and accountability and transparency? Well, we don't. And what is even worse? is that the deputy, pre, the deputy Minister is referring to this as well as a, a, an interim report. Why is it that this Premier accepts this kind of cover-up from her Minister and the Deputy? The member will withdraw. I will withdraw. Minister. Uh, speaker, the member opposite and members of the committee and others have that interim report. Speaker, if he can honestly say, if he had been minister and read that two page, albeit two page, interim report, and not have referred it to the OPP, I will completely disagree with him. There is enough in that report to refer to the OPP. I was not going to wait until the final report, Speaker. I thought the OPP should be notified immediately, and they were. The member will be seated. Stop the clock. I wish to point out to the member from Newmarket Aurora that was inappropriate. New question, the member from Nickelbelt. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Ma question pour la ministre. Question for the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Of being in a legal strike position, and after working without a contract since April, 4,500 Red Cross personal support workers will be on strike as of tomorrow morning. This is not a decision that these dedicated workers take lightly. Their priority is to deliver the highest quality of care to their patient, and striking is the absolute last resort. But, Speaker, these PSW have been left with no choice because of the terrible working conditions. Will the minister finally stop ignoring the pleas of Ontario PSW and fix the problems in home care? Thank you, Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Well, uh Thank you, Speaker. And I know the Minister of Labour will want to, uh, to respond in the supplementary. What I can say, Speaker, is that our PSWs are extraordinary people. They work very, very hard every day, bringing care to people who need it the most. Our commitment to PSWs is very strong, Speaker. I spent a, I spent a morning job shadowing a PSW in Milton not very long ago, where I saw firsthand the extraordinary work and the extraordinary care that they bring with them every single day. I urge both parties to get back to the table to find Order. a settlement, Speaker. But I can tell you, my respect, my admiration for PSWs is uh, is as strong as it could possibly be. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, talk and photo ops comes cheap. 
but high quality home care needs continuity of care and that means stepping up to finally end the poverty wages that these PSW that these women work under in the past two years PSWs have seen a seven percent loss in wages while the CEO of Red Cross sees a nine percent raise PSW simply cannot afford to pay the price of the government wrong-headed choices as of tomorrow morning tens of thousands of seniors will also start to pay the price of those wrong-headed decisions. Enough is enough, Mr. Speaker. Will the minister finally recognize that our home care system cannot function when workers cannot afford to work and do the work they love? Thank you. Minister. Minister of Labour. Labor. Thank you very much, Speaker. First of all, I want to welcome uh, Charlene Stewart, the president of SEIU Local One, uh, and Emmanuel Carvalho, executive vice president of SEIU Healthcare. Welcome to uh, Queen's Park, uh, Speaker. Uh, Speaker, uh, we're very much uh, aware of this situation, and uh, as uh, I would encourage all parties to make every effort to conclude an agreement. Uh, speaker, I think we know that best agreements are reached through collective uh, bargaining around the bargaining table. Um, uh, our Ministry of Labor mediator has been involved in the negotiation and has actually have met with the parties nine different uh, times in order to try to reach a deal. And there was a tentative deal, Speaker, as you may know. And our mediator remains uh, available, able to assist at any time. So, uh, Speaker, through you, I encourage all the parties uh, to be able to resume their, their and conversation and, and reach a, an agreement through collective bargaining. Thank you very Thank you. much. And your question? From Ottawa South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Infrastructure. Speaker, our government has recently introduced the Infrastructure for Jobs and Prosperity Act. This bill reinforces the importance of our government continuing to, to put an emphasis on infrastructure investments and build on the success of the last decade. Mr. Speaker, I would like to hear about some of the innovative and new aspects this bill will bring to infrastructure planning in Ontario. Of interest to young workers in my riding of Ottawa South is a new provision in the legislation that would require the use of apprentices on publicly funded infrastructure sure. projects. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, would the minister please update the House on the rationale of this particular aspect of the bill? Way to go. Thank you. Minister of Infrastructure and Transportation. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. As you know, our, our annual infrastructure spend in Ontario has grown since 2003, and I want to thank my, my colleague, Minister, Minister Trelli, for his leadership on this, to about $14 billion dollars uh, when, when my colleague uh, from Ottawa was the minister. We are now looking at building on that platform, Mr. Speaker, to require and develop partnerships with the private sector and labour to have registered apprenticeships attached to each of these projects. The Premier mentioned that there will be 300,000 new jobs created by 2015, according to the Conference Board of Canada. The Canadian Manufacturers and Exporters Association actually went further, Mr. Speaker, and said there would be 800,000 skilled jobs available in Ontario by 2016. We will now use our infrastructure Answer. spend, Mr. Speaker, to get the skills and education training to ensure the skilled workers are there to deal with this incredibly high rate of job creation, job Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the minister. Uh, this bill will surely go a long way in helping young skilled workers receive great work experience, and I'm particularly proud that our government has taken such a strong interest in helping more young skilled workers find employment. Mr. Speaker, encouraging the use of apprentices on public projects will help get more young workers into the skilled trades and address our skills shortage. However, there is some concern and criticism over the bill. Recently, the Toronto Star had a letter to the editor from the Consulting Engineers of Ontario who had expressed their displeasure that the paper had an article that characterized their profession as one that lacks design knowledge and has a propensity to construct ugly buildings. Mr. Speaker, while I know that this, is, that this view is not shared by our government, I was hoping the minister could address the language in this bill that requires Question. the architect to become involved in the design and construction of infrastructure projects. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, actually, I, I totally agree with uh, my friend from Ottawa South. We're actually, uh, you know, you've heard me give the example of the uh, Prince Edward Viaduct, what we some call, sometimes call the Bloor Viaduct. That was a collaboration, Mr. Speaker, between, I would argue, one of Ontario's greatest engineers, uh, Thomas Taylor, uh, and Edmund Burke, the, uh, the Canadian architect, not the philosopher. Um, 
And we recognize that when you bring the best of engineering with the best of architecture and design, you get the most efficient and high design uh, projects. Mr. Speaker, engineers which we, who we cherish and value are written into many of our legislation. We're now going to be treating other design professionals to create those kinds of collaborations because we're actually trying to stimulate more professional jobs for engineers and architects as part of our bill. Mr. Speaker, the party opposite was talking about the American system that Answer. we should adapt to, to their system. They've created a job creation rate, 50 percent of Ontario's, really pathetic, and it was, it was President Bush's uh, policies that plunged us into this, Mr. Speaker. So we take no less from the opposition. We're going to continue Thank to build you. infrastructure. Senator, please. New question, the member from Kitchener, Conestoga. Uh, my question is to the Premier. Premier, when the Auditor General reported on your reckless green energy policies two years ago, we learned that for every so called green job that's created, four more jobs are lost four. elsewhere in the economy. Four. In spite of the facts, you continue to propose reckless new economic policies. Now you're ramming Bill 91 through the legislature in an attempt to create up to half a billion dollars in new costs for retailers and manufacturers. And now killer. you're doing this even while major contributors to the province's recycling programs, like Heinz and Kellogg's, are leaving the province. Gone. Premier, simple question. Based on your analysis, how many jobs will be lost for every so-called green job under Bill 91? Quick killing jobs. Thank you. Quick killing Mr. jobs. Mr. Minister of the Environment. The environment. First of all, uh, Mr. Speaker, I would like to convey to the member and his uh, wonderful wife uh, congratulations on the birth of the new son. But the, uh, the excellent name, excellent choice of name, uh, Lincoln Lloyd Harris, and I also want to say that he weighed in at six pounds five ounces. <laughs> so. That's the good news. The bad news <laughs> is the constant attack of his father on all good things in the environment, <laughs> including Bill 91. I want to say to the member that I want to, I want to, admit, I want to admit some thievery. I actually stole a lot of the contents Answer. of Bill 91 from the paper produced oh! by the member of the opposition. Oh! I want him to take credit rather than be critical of a very progressive. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. I know Lincoln is actually watching uh, this morning, and I know he's pretty upset with that answer. So yeah. I'll, I'll actually the go back to the Premier because I'd like her at the end of the day to answer this question because she'll be responsible for any of the negative impacts of Bill 91. In fact, the letter Hines sent your government in September should have acted as a wake-up call. They pleaded with you to study the economic consequences of Bill 91, but you failed to answer because you clearly haven't conducted any economic analysis. Now they're leaving the province. Premier, it's time for you to take personally responsible for the actions of your government. Your environment minister is losing credibility on this file, not only with the stakeholders, but members of your own caucus. So, Premier, will you bail out the environment minister, bail him out. pull Bill 91 off the order paper, and Roma conduct Bowl. a proper economic analysis on yeah. Bill 91? Save his reputation. Mr. Speaker, I don't think there's anyone in this House who actually believes any company out there is going to make that kind of decision uh, when we're at second reading on an enabling piece of legislation in a minority parliament. You would recognize with any of these companies whether the product is Bruce produced Gray, in another Sound country or produced in Ontario, there's still the same requirement that is required in terms of uh, their responsibility for the ultimate recycling of those projects. Exactly. So I encourage members to uh, have these people come to committee, if we ever get to committee. I've encouraged everyone who has any comment at all on this piece of legislation to come to committee, to make their representations, to propose any yes, amendments that they deem appropriate. But I want to say that the heart of the legislation is really should be given to my good friend, the member for Kitchener, Conestoga. The question, the member from Tomiskamy Coffee. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. The Liberal government announced a sell-off of the ONTC without any consultation or regard for the North. 
18 months later, due to Northerners' work and pressure, the government was forced to reconsider their plan. Yep. But in Timmins this past Friday, the Premier made it clear that the cancellation of Northlander wasn't an option for reconsideration. At that same meeting, the Premier was issued a challenge to ride the bus from Cochrane to Toronto and see how hard it is for seniors and those who are asking who are seeking medical help to make to Toronto by bus. I've had people, seniors who helped build this province, who were forced to move from my riding because they couldn't take the bus from Toronto to Toronto. Is that the Premier's version of One Ontario? Will you consider yeah, reinstating yeah. passenger yeah. rail service for the people of Northeast yeah. Ontario? Yeah. Minister of Northern Development and Mines. Minister of Northern Development and Mines. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I think the member knows very well how hard we're working to make the right decisions related to the long term sustainability of the Ontario Northland Transportation Commission. We've got a ministerial advisory committee in place with people such as uh, Phnom President Alan Spatchett, North Bay Mayor Al McDonald, and we're working really hard on focusing on transforming the ONTC so that indeed it will have a long-term sustainable future. I've got some fine quotes here from the members which reflects the fact that we are focusing on tra transformation as opposed to divestment. We want to make the right decisions, the ones that are in the best interests of Northerners. We recognize how important the ONT is as an economic development tool in northeastern Ontario, and we're going to make the best decision to make sure that the that the, the ONTC has a bright future and one that's based on the right decisions being made, so that Thank we you. can make sure that the ONTC. Thank you. There are no deferred votes. This House stands recess until 3 p.m. this afternoon.